Hello, my name is Dr. Andrew Way from the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. I'm going to be discussing first and second line approaches to the treatment of older patients with acute myeloid leukemia. My outline will uh, focus on several drugs which have become available for potentially enhancing outcomes in patients fit enough for intensive chemotherapy, and these include gemtuzumab azogamycin, CPX351, and mitostorin, the FLT3 inhibitor. I'll also focus on drugs which may have the potential to enhance outcomes in patients not considered fit for intensive chemotherapy with a particular focus on venetoclax. Lastly, I will discuss a schema for the emerging patterns of care with new AML therapies incorporating IDH and FLT3 inhibitors for patients who are resistant or refractory to therapy. First of all, one of the most challenging areas is how we define patients who may not be considered fit for intensive chemotherapy. One of the largest studies ever conducted in this area was from MD Anderson, which studied almost 1,000 patients treated with intensive chemotherapy for patients who were 65 years and older. They identified six risk factors for eight-week mortality, and over 50% of the population had at least two of these risk factors. Patients that had two or more risk factors had an eight-week mortality rate of between 36 and 65%. Complete remission rates were between 19 and 40% for patients with two or more risk factors and median survival only one to four months. Therefore, this schema could potentially be used to separate patients who, were, who are fit or not fit for intensive chemotherapy in addition to clinician judgment, which has been the mainstay of making these decisions. The first drug I'd like to discuss with potential uh, for patients fit for intensive chemotherapy is gemtuzumab azogamycin. This is a CD33 targeted antibody conjugate which was FDA approved on September the 1st 2017. One of the key studies for this approval, uh, particularly in older patients, was the pivotal phase 3 alpha 0701 trial which was performed in patients with de novo AML between the ages of 50 and 70. The French group used a fractionated gemtuzumab dosing schedule involving 3 mg per meter squared of the drug given on days 1, 4 and 7 of induction. The induction was with a standard 7 plus 3 regimen including dornorubicin and citarabine. For patients that achieved a response, consolidation included a single day of gemtuzumab azogamycin on day one in combination with intermediate dose RSC and dornorubicin on day one. And up to two cycles of consolidation were delivered. The major comparison uh, between gemtuzumab and the control arm was recently published where an independent review uh, was done of the clinical data set. You can see that the median age of this population was between 61 and 62 years, and the majority of patients uh, were over the age of uh, 60. CD33 expression was less than 30% on between 13 to 15% of the population. Complete remission was very similar uh, between the, the gemtuzumab and control populations. Venoocclusive disease of grade 1 or more severity was slightly higher in the gemtuzumab arm and early death rate was also uh, similar uh, with 3.8% early deaths amongst patients receiving uh, gemtuzumab. Patients receiving gemtuzumab also had prolonged time to platelet recovery uh, in induction and also both consolidation uh, cycles. The primary endpoint was event-free survival, which was uh, significantly uh, improved in patients that received gemtuzumab azogamycin. The most recent analysis published in Hematologica showed a non-significant improvement in overall survival. An interesting analysis was done, performed on patients with uh, gemtuzumab azogamycin from the ALPHA study, uh, which examined the outcomes according to whether patients had high uh, CD33 expression, as denoted by positivity on more than 70% of the cells, or and 65% uh, of the population uh, expressed this. You can see from the survival curves that uh, only patients treated with azogamycin who had a high level of CD33 expression uh, seemed to benefit from the drug, whereas the one-third of patients that did not have an expression level above 70% did not appear to have a clinical benefit. 
and this suggests that it's important for CD33 to be expressed on the target cells to enable internalization of uh, gemtuzumab and its uh, colichomycin conjugate. The next drug is CPX351. This is liposomal sotarabine and dornorubicin, uh, delivered at a fixed 5 to 1 molar ratio by liposomal uh, encapsulation. The pivotal phase 3 study compared CPX351 at a dose of 100 units per meter squared given on days 1, 3 and 5 versus a 7 plus 3 control arm. Patients in remission uh, from uh, CPX351 uh, received an attenuated consolidation cycle involving 65 units per meter squared on days 1 and 3 and this was compared to a 5 plus 2 uh, consolidation involving cytarabine and dornorubicin for up to two cycles. It's important to note that from this study the eligibility uh, was restricted to patients who were 60 to 75 years of age and patients needed to have either therapy-related AML, AML secondary to myelodysplastic syndrome or chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, or patients needed to have AML with MDS-related cytogenetic abnormalities according to the WHO classification. Importantly, prior HMA exposure for myelodysplastic syndrome or CWML was also allowed in the eligibility. The primary endpoint of overall survival showed that CPX351 improved survival in this poor risk elderly population compared to 7 plus 3. Interestingly, a post hoc analysis showed that outcomes were particularly favourable for patients that went on to have a stem cell transplant who received prior CPX351 with substantial survival, survival gains even after transplant compared to patients previously treated with 7 plus 3. A subgroup analysis shows that uh, patients who were uh, between the ages of 70 and 75 years uh, benefited from CPX351. However, patients that had prior HMA exposure for MDS did not appear to benefit as much as other subgroups.